The Castel Sant'Angelo, which means Castle of the Holy Angel, was originally built in the 2nd century as a mausoleum for Emperor Hadrian. It housed the remains of Hadrian and many of his successors. It eventually became part of the city wall and later was turned into a fortress before it functioned as a papal residence and finally as a barracks and military prison. Today it's a national museum. The mausoleum was connected to the city by the Pons Elias or Bridge of Hadrian. The bridge is now known as the Ponte Sant'Angelo. The bridge was designed by the personal architect to Emperor Hadrian and was completed in 134 AD. Contrary to popular belief, the bridge was actually created before Hadrian's mausoleum. The ten statues, which each bear a symbol of the suffering and death of Christ, were designed by Italian master sculptor John Lorenzo Bernini and edited during the 17th century. He personally sculpted two of the statues, but the originals were later moved to a church near the Spanish steps. Now, before we take a tour of the Castel Sant'Angelo, here are some fun facts about Rome. So what I want to do now is give a little history of Rome, how Rome got its name, uh, how Rome got its nickname, and how the Roman Empire became so vast, and then what caused the end of the Roman Empire. So first, how did Rome get its name? Well, legend has it that two twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, uh, when they were infants or, or children, they were abandoned by the river Tiber. And uh, both Romulus and Remus were brought up by a she-wolf. And at one point when it became adults, they were looking to found a new city. And uh, legend has it that uh, Romulus decided to kill his twin brother Remus and named the city after himself. So Romulus became Rome. Now, how did Rome get its nickname, the Eternal City? Well, the Roman Empire was so vast that Romans didn't think it would ever end. So basically they thought it would go on for eternity, hence the name, the Eternal City. Now, in terms of the vastness of the Roman Empire, why was it so successful? <laughs> One big reason is that the Roman army was a professional fighting force. That was their job. So they were really good at what they did, and they were able to conquer all their enemies and expand the empire, which by the way was through most of Europe, uh, the Balkans, the Mediterranean, and parts of the Middle East. That's how big it was. Another reason why they were so successful is for the first time, they built new infrastructure. And for example, you see aqueducts everywhere in not just Italy, but in Turkey, in Spain, and many parts of Europe. And they were able to connect cities and towns using different engineering feats, including aqueducts. So what happened to the Roman Empire? Why did it eventually fall apart? Uh, there's many reasons. Uh, one is there was political corruption. Uh, another reason is there was over-reliance on slave labor. Uh, another reason is there were a lot of mercenaries that were fighting for the Romans, but they had no allegiance to Rome or the Roman army. And they, a lot of times they would actually uh, turn against their Roman superiors. And eventually that did in the Roman Empire. Another reason is uh, Christianity was becoming more and more important, which means that the Roman generals were becoming less and less important as far as their influence was concerned. So the Roman Empire lasted about 500 years, and I think it ended around 500, 600 AD perhaps. Uh, but what we see today all over Rome are the remnants of the Roman Empire and it's pretty amazing uh, the history that is here. And I have to say, it's one thing about reading about history in, in, in textbooks when you're in school, but it's another thing to stand in a place where history took place. Uh, whether you're at the Roman Forum, the Colosseum, the Vatican, or in back of me, the uh, Castel Sant'Angelo, which we're about to enter. So anyway, I hope that was informative and we'll see you soon. So we're here at the Castel Sant'Angelo, uh, which is the original mausoleum of Hadrian. And this is one of the buildings in Rome. There's a lot of original uh, elements to it, as you can see. Because it looks pretty darn old. This is the Bastion of San Marco, which was built in the 15th century to complete the transformation of Hadrian's mausoleum to a fortress. It got its present look in the 17th century when it was adapted for use with heavy artillery. Yeah, it looks cool. Is that like a big slingshot? What was this? It looks like a prison for small people. Or I should say, vertically challenged people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
This is the bastion of San Giovanni. What I like about this is that the people back then were pretty short, just like me. What do we got here? Some cannons. Some of the old weapons. Yeah, this is the, uh, the guard room. Two steps straight away. We're now in the center of the ancient Hadrian's mausoleum. The Courtyard of Honor, also known as the Angel's Courtyard, gives you access to the papal apartments which were built in the 15th century. This angel statue, which originally topped the Castel Sant'Angelo and was made by Raffaello da Montelupo, an apprentice of Michelangelo, is now located here. The upper armory consists of four adjoining rooms containing weapons that house a collection of over 6,000 pieces. The first room is devoted to the Risorgimento, the movement that led to Italy's unity and independence. This room includes uniforms from the mid-19th century. The second room contains weapons with ivory, silver, and wooden inlays that were made at the end of the 16th century by the influential Farnese family. The Grand Loggia was completed in 1543 at the behest of Pope Paul III, who was born Alessandro Farnese. He was the counter-reformation pope who organized the church's answer to Martin Luther's Protestant reform movement. He also commissioned Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. The library is the main room in one of the two apartments that Paul III built in the 1540s. The room provided access to the papal archives. This is the treasury room. However, some believe it was a hall where funeral ceremonies took place for emperors. It was also possibly used as a treasury, although it most likely housed papal archives instead of gold. This 
This room was also built by Pope Paul III in the 1540s. The frieze depicts a procession of tritons and dancing sea nymphs, as well as male and female figures alternating with unicorns. Originally, the room had a gold and silver painted ceiling, but it was destroyed by fire from a fireworks display. This room was originally built in 1543 and was the upper floor of Paul III's loggia. You can tell by how narrow these stairs are that people were much smaller back then. The round room was the site of the first medieval chapel dedicated to the Archangel Michael in the castle. The Hall of Columns was built under the papacy of Benedict XIV Lambertini in order to contain the new archive. Tables were placed here for archivists. The windows were equipped with removable doors to prevent damage from fireworks on the terrace above. On July 4, 1798, the documents were hastily transferred to the Vatican, where they currently remain, due to the French occupation. In 1799, all the furniture was destroyed. We're now standing on the Angel Terrace. From the Angel Terrace, you can get some great views of Rome. This is St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. This is the secret passageway to the Vatican, known as the Passetto di Borgo. Two popes in particular are known to have used this passage in times of peril. Pope Alexander VI fled the Vatican via the Passetto in 1494, seeking security in Castel Sant'Angelo when Charles VIII of France invaded Italy in the Italian War of 1494. In 1527, Pope Clement VII was able to escape the sack of Rome via the Passetto when Holy Roman Emperor Charles V invaded Rome with his army, killing all but 42 of the 189 Swiss guards on duty. I believe that is the Vittorio Emmanuel II monument. Right there. There's the river Tiber or Tiber. This is a statue of an angel built by the 18th century Flemish sculptor Peter Verschefeldt. The bronze statue replaced an earlier marble version. The statue depicts the Archangel Michael, who according to legend, appeared on top of the fortress in the year 590 AD and miraculously ended the severe plague that had infested the city of Rome. After this event, the building was renamed Castel Sant'Angelo, literally translated St. Angel Castle or Castle of the Holy Angel, in honor of the Archangel. This is one of my favorite rooms in the Castel Sant'Angelo. It was Paul III's entertaining room in his apartment. It was decorated between 1545 and 1547 and was designed to be lavish to show the dominance of the Roman Church. On the ceiling we can see Paul III's coat of arms and episodes of the life of Alexander the Great. The Perseus Chamber is Paul III's studio, one of the private rooms in the apartments. It was built in the 1540s. The name comes from the subject of the Frieze painting, which was made from 1545 to 1546. Perseus is the mythological hero who defeated the Medusa, and the Frieze depicts his adventures. This is the bedroom of Paul III called the Cupid and Psyche room. The name is based on the subject of the frieze, the story of Cupid and Psyche. Cupid was the son of Venus.
The Hall of Apollo is the main hall on the first floor of the papal apartments, built by Niccolo V. The large barrel vaulted hall owes its name to the cycle of frescoes that Paul III had made in 1547. The frescoes executed on the vault include a grotesque decoration and 10 panels depicting the stories of Apollo as executioner and inspirer of wisdom. So this is some of the original flooring. The atrium is the entrance to Hadrian's mausoleum and is made of large blocks of travertine, originally covered with marble slabs, now lost. The large niche in the background housed a large statue of Emperor Hadrian. Funeral processions were held here. Well, that's the end of the tour. If you're planning a visit to Rome, there's plenty of history and mystery to make the Castel Sant'Angelo worth a visit.